And to kickstart the show today, if you've just joined us, welcome. This is the Week in Review with myself, Liesl Wilson, where we take a look at some of the big stories happening that happened in the week ahead, of course, uh, and also what has kept uh, South Africans talking throughout the week. So without further ado, let's take a look at your top story today. It includes ESCOM, which says, although power generation challenges remain, it is not anticipating any black, uh, rolling blackouts this weekend. It says the generation capacity recovered enough to enable it to stop the rolling blackouts. It comes after the power utility ramped up power cuts to stage four, leaving the country largely without electricity last week. However, some South Africans are now counting the cost of ESCOM's rolling blackouts as some of the electrical appliances were left damaged. At the same time, farmers are warning that there may be shortages of produce, including wheat, should ESCOM's rolling blackouts continue as they cannot irrigate properly due to lack of power. We also saw some hospitals, including Chris uh, Haini Baragwanath Hospital in Soweto, being forced to cut down on elective surgery due to limited electricity supply. So, so as the woes continue, we're joined by energy expert Lungile Mashile for a little bit more in-depth analysis. Lungile, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us here today on the Week in Review. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. You know, with ESCOM hoping to have been unbundled perhaps into three entities, namely generation distribution and uh, transmission companies, by the end of December 2021, in your opinion, how do you, th you think this is going to impact South Africans going forward? Look, for South Africans, um, it won't really have an impact. It's important to remember that ESCOM had prepared for unbundling mm. from 2008 already, which was supposed to have taken place a whole lot sooner. In fact, from 1998, um, and, and it should have been, you know, it should have happened and it's delayed um, and we're only doing it now. Now, in terms of how it's going to actually impact us, absolutely no impact. This is more for ESCOM, for their own profit centers um, and their own accountability, ultimately. The CEO tells us that internally they have already separated and they're already starting to bill uh, certain um, units and and um, divisions. So internally it is done and they're hoping that by the end of December it will be finalized. All right, so obviously there was a press conference this week and answering a question about Finance Minister Ino Godongwana's suggestion that ESCOM could perhaps sell um, the coal power stations to address its debt burden. Andre De Reiter pointed out that this was a decision outside of the uh, purview of the Electricity Power State Hall and, and perhaps should be left up to the National Treasury. Could you perhaps contextualize and unpack uh, this? Is it a viable option? If so, how? You know, it's very important for us to have some historical context when we talk about selling off of state assets. We've been here with SASO, with Telcom, mm. and recently with, you know, SAA. And ultimately, if the, because we, as the public, through our taxes, we invested in these assets, and now they're going to be sold off. Are they being sold off at fair value? And over and above that, these entities, Telcom and the likes, you know, um, SAA, even ESCOM, they, they have a very significant impact on our economy. Um, and keeping them in government hands is good for the economy, is good for government also. Um, and they're able to provide services that would not otherwise reach poorer people. If you're going to privatize everything, including electricity, where is the incentive for the private entity to provide low cost electricity that the that that poor people can actually afford. Um, so it's 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 a very tricky thing and it's a story that has to be watched because it has significant impact, not just from the letting go of the assets themselves, but in terms of ESCOM debt, they owe a number of multinational banks 450 billion rand. Mm -hmm. And the question then becomes these assets that will be sold, will they be sold at fair value? That represents what they owe. We know what happened in the case of SAA where they, they, they had a lot of debt and through its unbundling or you know selling off of you know SAA, South Africans had been left with that debt. So it didn't go with the entity uh, that bought you know SAA. So these are all the little nuances that need to be sorted out and it's a very important story if we're going down this road. 
Oh, absolutely. It seems that throwing money at the problem hasn't worked. Uh, rolling power outages are continuing despite, you know, as you've mentioned, ESCOM getting an annual 23 billion bailout over a decade uh, from 2019. And, and uh, obviously this was also announced back in the 2019 budget. But um, we're looking at the issues of policy coherence, the issues of implementation, and, and also the hard work that needs to come um, from the from from turning around the the state of uh, affairs there. I mean, how does this add to investor confidence and their woes uh, looking from the outside in? You know, one of the things that have been highlighted uh, by Andre this week was with regards to issues around regulation, mm. around procurement, around, you know, funding. And one of the key things is that, you know, as you rightfully mentioned, that in the 2019 budget speech, ESCOM was actually granted 23 billion rand a year over a three-year period. So mm. ultimately, it was going to be six, 69 billion. What we do know so far, after numerous court cases, only 10 billion of that has been granted granted. So ISCOM is right in saying that they're not receiving the money that had that that was allocated to them and is causing significant issues internally. However, when um, lenders see what is happening, not just with regards to ESCOM's um, finances, but also with regards to the procurement and the operational um, challenges, it's not a good sign for potential lenders. They are looking at ESCOM as a potential risk, and need, needless to say, if something happens to ESCOM, if ESCOM defaults is unable to service debt, because a lot of their de debt is government guaranteed, it will create a run on South Africa's government itself. And I don't think that our government has 450 billion just lying around to pay everybody. Lumire, uh, ESCOM's own figures and, and based on some of the uh, other modeling means, I mean, indicate that a possible easing of these rotational power outages will only, um, you know, end in 2023. So, so in lieu of this and in the interest of time, I mean, what are some of your thoughts on, on the future of electricity generation in the country um, going forward? Look, so there's the short-term aspect of it. And in the short term, we need to get as much generation in as we can possibly get. Mm -hmm. This can come from multiple sources, from IPPs that have already built, that have excess capacity. It can also come from the demand side management aspect. So if, for, if for, for instance, um, you have the uh, means to, to uh, reduce your consumption um, and install solar PV batteries or inverters in your own homes, just so you reduce that requirement. That goes a very long way. And you'll recall that um, through the risk mitigation IPP, we were supposed to procure about two and a half thousand megawatts of additional capacity that was going to be available almost in, um, in the next 18 months. This, how, however, has not sort of materialized. None of those projects have reached financial close. And we do know that the car power ship, for instance, project is caught up in a court case. Um, so in the short term, we do have a significant challenge. In the long term, it is more clearer because we have the integrated resource plan. And it's very clear there that we're going to procure additional renewables, both wind, solar, we're going to procure gas. There is talks of um, uh, nuclear also, uh, and that RFP is expected next, next year. And there is talks of additional coal as well so the long term it's fine it's the short term where there's a four to six thousand megawatt gap that needs to be filled urgently Lungile Mashele, thank you very much for your time energy expert uh, chatting to us about the unfoldings at escom again faced with up to three outages a day many people in south africa are in despair over escom and and whether it will ever be able to meet power supply demands the power outages have created havoc in the business sector with small businesses struggling to survive the repeated disruptions of their operation ability. Uh, Lungile just giving us an update perhaps on what transpired from the press briefing earlier this week and uh, where to from here for the uh, SOE at large. Well, in other news this week, Finance Minister Enoch Godongwana has told Parliament in his first medium-term budget policy statement that over 60% of the budget will be directed towards service delivery and poverty alleviation. According to the policy statement, over 1 trillion rand will be spent in housing, social protection, transport, employment programs and also local entities. 
Kotongwana says that the uh, provision of social relief of distress grants will push up the number of South Africans on social welfare to 28 million uh, people. But for more on this, we're joined by independent analyst Jimmy Moyaha for an update perhaps on what transpired and, and perhaps what the sentiments are coming out of that speech. Jimmy, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon. We're looking at uh, how each year for the past 10 years, at least the medium term budget policy statement has been touted as a penultimate moment for South Africa's economy. And, and this was, this was uh, you know, no different due to, to the COVID-19 pandemic and of course some of the economic um, collapses we've seen um, that, that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has presented. I mean, what has been the overall reaction to the speech in the markets and, and why so? So the, the, the initial reaction, I mean, there were some positive elements of the speech. Um, I think largely um, it was well received within the market from an investor uh, standpoint. Um, I think there were obviously some areas of concern from the from the unions that were expressed and from some other um, business entities. But I think overall, the minister did the best he could to deliver an astute speech that was quite in line with what we anticipated from um, him having taken over from his predecessor, and th th it, it brought about um, some reassurances in some areas, but of course there were some areas that um, could have been touched on a lot better, that didn't need to be kicked down the road to budget 2022, um, but overall I think the, the, the sentiment around it from, at least from a RAND perspective, was there was initial uh, positivity, um, and there was also some uh, positivity around the equity markets, very little from an equity markets perspective, but from the RAND's perspective, there was some initial positivity around some of the things the minister had to say. Mm. Well, it was the first for Finance Minister Eno Kotongwana, and many expected that he would continue with his predecessors' more economically prudent policies. What, what were some of those standout points for you? So there, there were those um, continuation points that we did see. I mean, there was, I think one of the big ones for me was the uh, announcement that the finance ministry was going to put another 11 billion rand into Sassria to aid business relief. So that was something very positive and the rand received that very positively as well when that was announced. Um, I think there were some other good standout points around wanting to curb expenditure, maintain expenditure within our limits and, and sort of not overspend and, and the fact that um, any uh, temporary income or short-term short income that comes in shouldn't be used towards long-term commitments. Um, there was positivity around the fact that there won't be any tax increases, um, rather a focus on improving uh, the tax collection from a SARS perspective, which has already been um, quite positive uh, in that respect. So there were some, some good standout points that I felt that um, the minister did touch on um, in, in the speech. Jimmy, uh, the question begs, has South Africa's financial position worse, worsened? I mean, we're looking at the costs of the unrest emerging four months after the unrest occurred. MassMart coming out to announce last week that the, the KZN rights amounted to about 2.5 billion rand worth of damages. I mean, uh, w what's emerging on that front there? And in the same breath, uh, from, from the speech uh, on Thursday, I mean, what, what was lacking? What were the market expecting, waiting to hear and see? What didn't come for, uh, through this time round? So from a cost perspective, and I think from from a, a situation, an economic situation in South Africa, it's definitely worsened. I mean, it's been on the decline since 2008. Um, we have seen significantly uh, higher in, uh, levels of debt to GDP ratios growing from 2008. Um, we've seen all of the metrics that are used to measure an economy have been deteriorating since 2008. So your income to GDP ratio, your um, disposable income, your growth uh, rate or your wage inflation rate, wage rate versus inflation rates, all of those metrics that are typically used to measure um, the, the health and the uh, growth of an economy have been on the decline for quite some time. And this was pre-pandemic. So mm. um, the, the pandemic situation, the unrest situation, those exacerbated those um, conditions even even further and exacerbated those condition, uh, situations. But we were on the decline prior to that. If you remember very carefully, we were downgraded prior to the pandemic by ratings agencies. So the structural reforms and the things that we needed to look at from that perspective were, uh, were things that were in place and that were already systemic within our um, economy prior to uh, the global pandemic happening. Um, the global pandemic, I mean, there were some positives that we could draw from that from um, 
how it was handled in some respects, but there were also some negatives. But to, to look at the, the state of the South African situation, that was dire before uh, the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the, the, the speech and what was lacking within the speech, are the same things that were lacking from pre the pandemic levels. Um, I mean, I spoke about this in 2019, I believe, before the 2020 speech, before we were downgraded to say that there were certain reforms that were needed quite urgently. There were certain things that were needed quite urgently from um, an SOE perspective, from looking at the base, um, public sector wage bill, from looking at infrastructure expenditure. Those sorts of things were problems from pre-pandemic levels, and now they're resurfacing again. So some of the things that we mentioned back in 2019, the ratings agencies are now mentioning now. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's a lot of things that um, were missed, but these are things that um, were overlooked. I mean, the, the pandemic pretty much overshadowed everything that could have been reported on um, from an economics perspective because the pandemic was um, a, a significantly more impactful uh, event in recent times. Uh, Jimmy, I, you know, I have to conclude this conversation. You've spoken about structural reforms where implementation seems to be lacking in some instances. But I also want to, to look at how precarious the budget deficit for South Africa is after this policy statement. And perhaps just looking into ahead into 2022 um, with the SARS revenue shortfalls, is that expected to? I mean, where, where are we going to be getting the money from? Where to from here for the country? So, I mean, from, from here, the, the main thing and the, the midterm budget policy statement traditionally has been an area where policy has been outlined mm -hmm. to then be um, followed up with by implementation strategies in the budget in, 20, uh, in, the, in the following year or in the preceding year. So if we look at where we stand at the point, our, our problem has never been the drafting of policy. It has never been the creation of policy. And I can give you an example as far back as 2007. There was an IPAP policy in 2007 that was focused on growing manufacturing employment numbers. The target was to grow manufacturing employment numbers by 2020 by at least 3, 000, uh, 350,000 people or 350,000 jobs. Instead, by the end of 2020, the result of that was um, a decline of 218,000. So not only did the growth not happen, but we actually went backwards. Now, mm -hmm. that figure, we, we can definitely not account all of that down to what happened in a pandemic type of situation. So if we look at a policy perspective from the midterm budget policy statement, there's nothing wrong with policies. Um, it's, it's always around the implementation. There's never been follow through on the policies. Investors are concerned about that. There's talk about not bailing out SOEs, but we've heard this talk in the past, mm. and then what happens around the budget? We bail out SOEs again. So the, the policies that are drafted by Treasury, by government, those policies are very solid policies. It, it's when we need to then follow through with those policies that we start to see lacking. Basic things we could do around implementation and around a way forward mm. is you can sit and you can um, take on something like semi-privatizing SOEs. This is something I mentioned in 2019. Again, it's something Moody's and other ratings agencies mentioned post this particular speech. And the, the general concern around it, I mean, from a union perspective, is if we semi-privatize, we lose jobs mm. and that sort of thing. But that's not the case. If you semi-privatize, you hold um, institutions accountable because there are more stakeholders involved. You All right, Jimmy Moyak, I'm going to have to leave the conversation there. So much to unpack and look at. But again, independent uh, analyst Jimmy Moyaka, uh, just uh, chatting about uh, the medium term budget policy statement, of course, as announced uh, by Finance Minister for the first time um, on Thursday. Again, reactions coming through, giving us an overall analysis of what uh, emerged from that uh, MTPPS. Thank you for your time. Now, uh, in other news, some South African learners will have to write control tests ahead of the end of your exams. The Department of Basic Education says schools will test learners only on the parts of the syllabus that they have covered. The department added that rotational school attendance was one of the contributing factors to some schools not completing the syllabus. But at the very same time, the South African Human Rights Commission wants to urgently meet with the various government departments to discuss and enter rotational timetables at primary schools. But for more on this, uh, we're joined by the Department of Basic Education spokesperson Elijah Mklanga. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, obviously, w just uh, perhaps walk us through why the department has decided that learners should be writing control tests instead of the, the end of year exams um, as done previously.
All right, uh, we're just going to rehash the, uh, the question. Elijah Mklang is the Department of Basic Education spokesperson, again chatting to us about uh, the department's announcement where some South African learners will be uh, writing control tests instead of end of year exams. Elijah, if you can hear me, I'm just going to repose the question. The decision by the department to enforce this writing control tests instead of end of year exams like before, what exactly will this entail? Why was this decision? taken well good afternoon and thank you so much for the opportunity well in 2020 the department took a decision that uh, formal full-scale exams should not be written because learners did not have enough time to cover the entire curriculum but over and above that we were using a trimmed curriculum so we're not able to follow the usual program mm. in the academic year in the in the system and uh, we came into 2021 we still continued with rotational timetabling and also still using the trimmed curriculum. And again, because of the rotation, we're not able to cover the entire curriculum. So the difference between a full scale exam and a, a control test is that with a control test, you test learners on the basis of what you've been able to cover in the curriculum. Whereas with a full scale examination, you're able to test them on everything that has been uh, in the um, that has been taught, uh, which means the entire set work for the year. And uh, with that, you are then able to do an examination. But that assumes that uh, there were not disruptions, schools were not forced to close, and that you were able to teach everything, which was not the case uh, in the majority of our schools in the country. All right, Elijah Mklanga, Department of Basic Education spokesperson, just chatting to us about some South African learners will be writing control tests instead of end of year exams. Again, the Department of Basic Education says that uh, schools will test learners only on the parts of the syllabus rather than they have covered. It's where we're going to leave the show for you today. It has been an absolute pleasure, as always, from myself, Liesl Wilson, and the team. Until tomorrow for a look at the week ahead, it's goodbye for now.